Andrews, South Brisbane. Please turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 1, on page 1192 of the Church Bibles. Epistemology is to do with how we know what we know. How's that for a sermon opening? In the Nicene Creed we say, we believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. I know that the use of Catholic can cause confusion. It means universal or worldwide. We are part of the worldwide church, as are the Roman Catholics. But they're only one part of it, as are we. I hope that's clear. But it's the apostolic reference that I want to focus on. What does that mean? Paul describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus. An apostle is literally one who is sent. Jesus had 12 disciples or students whom he sent to preach the gospel, at which point they became apostles. To these we can add Paul on the basis that on the Damascus Road, the resurrected Jesus had appeared to him and sent him as well. This is in accordance with Acts stipulation. But an apostle needs to be an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe in what the apostles have handed down to us. And it's handed down in written form in the Bible, including Paul's first letter to Timothy, which we're looking at today. Paul refers to Timothy as my true son in the faith. The faith. It's not any old faith or set of beliefs, but the faith. This is reflected in one of the Queen's titles. She's defender of the faith. In this case, specifically, the doctrines of the Church of England. At the coronation, she was asked, Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law? And the reference to the faith is echoed at the end of our passage with regard to the gospel, verse 11, that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. Through many a day of darkness, through many a scene of strife, the faithful few fought bravely to guard the nation's life. Their gospel of redemption, sin pardoned, man restored, was all in this enfolded, one church, one faith, one Lord. What is the alternative? It's what seemingly was going on in Ephesus, where Timothy was. Paul writes, verse 3, Stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. The certain people were, I'm afraid, church leaders, or at least house group leaders. They presumably started off okay, 
when they were appointed. But now they've erred and strayed from God's ways like lost sheep. They've followed too much the devices and desires of their own hearts. It's sad when this happens, but equally regrettably, it's hardly unusual. In fact, it keeps on happening. At the end of the book of Judges in the Old Testament, we read, In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And that was 1000 BC. Why does this happen? I'm afraid a reason can be boredom. People like novelty, hearing something new. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, The time will come when people are not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. An irony is, however, that, as the book of Ecclesiastes reminds us, there is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. If a theologian or preacher comes up with something he or she thinks is brand spanking new, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's rooted in a heresy dating back to the first four centuries. Instead, I'll stick with the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Although, strangely, that too can be a source of problems. The Beatles sang, All You Need Is Love, and that seemed to be the gist of Michael Curry's sermon at Harry and Meghan's marriage service. And look how that turned out. Verse 5, Paul writes, The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Yes, the goal is love, quite right. But how does this goal come about? How do we achieve true Christian love? Paul tells us. It comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. If you just say, all that's needed is to be loving, that may well lead you astray. All kinds of wrongs can be tolerated in the name of love And that isn't actually the loving thing to do. True love, Christian love, is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of a pure heart, not having motives that are compromised by power, popularity, or money. It's a byproduct of a good conscience not having a compromised lifestyle, uh, convincing yourself that something's okay when you know deep down that it isn't. True love is a byproduct of sincere faith. And here we're back to avoiding false doctrines, myths, and endless genealogies. Verse 6. Some have departed from these a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith and have turned to meaningless talk. Any child living in Obramagau has a right to appear in the Passion Play at which I have just returned from. We heard that those on stage had been told two things. Don't look at the audience and 
Look toward Jesus. That's good advice in all situations and circumstances. Look toward Jesus. Don't let yourself be distracted or sidetracked. And make sure it's Jesus as he's presented in the Bible. Paul continues, verse 8. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. And Paul then gives us a summary of the Ten Commandments, starting with our relationship with God and then moving on to our relationships with one another. The reformer Martin Luther said that we need the law in order to drive us from the law and instead drive us to Christ. The law is a good guide for the Christian life, but a terrible master. It's Jesus who sets us free through belief in him, not the law. Jesus' death and resurrection on our behalf. The purpose of the law is to expose the sin of the world like a floodlight and drive people to the gospel. I was once given a sticker that showed a jar of honey with a label that said, don't just keep the faith, spread it. Actually, we need to do both. The faith needs to be taken hold of first and owned by us if we are to be in a position to pass it on to others. And having that sincere faith gives us the love toward others that motivates us to want to share our knowledge of Jesus with them. How are you doing on that score? Amen.
Thank you.